consent motion for the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill. Clark, please read the motion. That this Assembly agrees, in line with Section 87 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, the principle of the extension to Northern Ireland of the provisions of the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill, dealing with Social Security Coordination as contained in the Bill, which was introduced in the House of Commons on 5 March 2020. Thank you. I call the Minister for Communities to move the motion. Minister Aura Lidahal. Poor Margaret, last can call your Mulliman round. I beg to move. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate, so please open the debate on the motion. The primary focus of the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill is to end the EU's rules on free movement of persons in respect of Britain at the end of the transition period on the 31st of December 2020. These are currently retained in British law by the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. So this will mean that EEA nationals not resident in Britain at the end of the transition period and their family members will require permission to enter and remain in Britain under the Immigration Act 1971. Immigration and freedom of movement within the EEA are accepted matters under Schedule 2 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 and are the responsibility of the Home Office. However, the Bill also makes provision for the Secretary of State or Treasury or Department here uh, acting jointly to make regulations to modify, for example, amend, revoke or repeal retained EU law relating to Social Security coordination. Social Security Coordination is part of the ongoing negotiations with the EU on future relations. The legislation in question is Regulation EC No. 883 Bar 204 on the Coordination of Social Security Systems and its Associated Implementation Regulation, Regulation EC No. 987 Bar 209. Also Regulation EEC No. 1 408 bar 71 on the application of social security schemes to employed persons, to self-employed persons and to members of their family moving within the community and its associated implementing regulation, regulation EEC number 574 bar 72 and regulation EEC number 859 bar 2003, extending regulation EEC number 1408 bar 71 to nationals of non-EU member countries. Any changes to the coordination rules would only apply to people moving between the EU and Britain after the end of the transition period. The British Government signed an agreement with the Irish Government in February 2019, which protects the social security rights of all Irish and British citizens moving within the common travel area. Freedom of movement is an accepted matter, and the current Social Security Coordination Regulations operate in the context of freedom of movement within the EU. The regulations are a somewhat complex web of accepted and evolved issues, including the determination of the state to which contributions should be paid, competency for the awards of benefits, aggregation of contributions and the periods of residence for benefit entitlement, and provisions for some benefits, such as child benefit, which are the responsibility of HMRC. I understand that the aim of the British Government remains to seek a new agreement with the EU and in the event of a negotiated deal. It now seems that the British Government process to replace the retained Social Security Coordination Regulations with a new reciprocal agreement. Reciprocal agreements are international treaties and fall within the ambit of international relations. As members are aware, international relations are accepted matters. In the event of a deal, it seems therefore that the British Government proposes to revoke the retained Social Security Coordination Regulations and the revocation would also apply across Britain under the ambit of accepted matters including international relations. However, the negotiations are ongoing, and until the negotiations are complete and a deal is agreed, we will not know the precise scope and content of the new agreement. If a deal is not agreed and there, are no reciprocal, there, are, there is no reciprocal agreement with the EU, 
retaining the power in Clause 5 for a department tier to amend the coordination regulations may give us some flexibility over the limited devolve issues within the coordination regulations. Furthermore, Clause 5 provides a power, provides a power to make consequential amendments, for example, to address inoperabilities or inconsistencies which may arise from the modification of the retained Social Security Coordination Regulations. This provides a power to ensure the continued operation of domestic Social Security legislation that refers to or is related to the Social Security Coordination Regulations. If this motion were not to pass today, it is therefore anticipated that the British Government would move to amendments to remove the power of the Department here to make regulations under Clause 5 of the Bill. So this means that we would have no power to modify the retained Social Security Coordination Regulations in the event of a no agreement on Social Security Coordination being reached between Britain and the EU or to make consequential amendments to our Social Security law. The only option to obtain such a power would be to bring a separate bill to the Assembly. There would be no power for the Assembly to amend the EU Social Security Coordination Regulations until such a bill completed its passage. I am also aware that it is anticipated that there will be very significant demands across departments for bills to be progressed through the Assembly before the end of the current mandate, so retaining these provisions in the Westminster Bill would help release some of the expected pressure on the legislative programme. I know that members will have seen the briefing provided by the Human Rights Commission in relation to the Westminster Bill. The Commission has made a number of recommendations which, in my opinion, are well outside of my remit, but I have written to the British Home Office urging the Westminster Government to give the Human Rights Commission recommendations serious consideration. I have weighed up carefully the arguments for and against uh, these uh, proposals, and on balance, I have decided to move these today. I beg to move. I call Paula Bradley, Chair of the Community for Commitment. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and the committee thanks the Minister for bringing this motion today. I am sure that all members here in the chamber will have read the committee's report published on the 8th of July 2020 on the Legislative Consent Memorandum on the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill, but just in case, I will also provide some background and update members. The committee was briefed by the Department on the main purposes of the bill and on the Legislative Consent Memorandum on the 11th of June 2020. The primary purpose of the Bill is to end the EU's rules on free movement of persons in respect of the UK at the end of the transition period, thereby bringing EEA nationals and their family members under UK immigration control. Members will undoubtedly have their own views on this specific issue, but it is important to emphasise that immigration and freedom of movement are expected matters under Schedule II of the Northern Ireland Act 1998. As such, this Assembly has no powers to amend those laws that pertain to immigration and freedom of movement. However, the Bill will protect the status of Irish citizens in UK immigration law once free movement rights end. As Social Security is a devolved matter, the NI Assembly does have a role in considering the Social Security Coordination Regulations, and this is really the focus of the memorandum. In particular, Clause 5 of the Bill will introduce powers to enable Westminster and the Assembly to amend retained EU law governing Social Security Coordination post-EU exit. Clause 5 and consequently, consequently Schedules 2 and 3 of the Bill was therefore the key clause for committee consideration. At its briefing on the 11th of June, the committee was advised that the Executive had agreed to proceed with the Legislative Consent Motion on this issue. Notwithstanding what I have just said regarding immigration and free movement of persons, the Committee recognised that the retained regulations are a complex mix of accepted and devolved matters and a joint approach to amending these regulations, i.e. between a Minister of the Crown and the NI Assembly, therefore offers the potential to amend the law in a coherent way. That is what the Bill will allow should the motion be supported today. 
Members were assured that the devolved competence of the Assembly would be respected and future subordinate legislation would require the repro approval of the Assembly. This is, of course, to be welcomed. There was some concern initially that giving Westminster the power to legislate on our behalf might somehow constrain the ability of the Assembly to legislate on social security matters. Therefore, during consideration of Clause 5, members asked the Department about the viability or advantage of taking forward an Assembly Bill on these matters, rather than agree to a Bill being taken forward by Westminster. However, the Department assured the Committee that the Bill does not deal with the specifics of Social Security benefit, but rather gives the Assembly the powers to make regulations in respect of Social Security coordination following a future agreement between the UK and the EU. However, some members did note their general uneasiness with the use of LCMs in principle rather than bespoke Assembly legislation. It is not the way we would prefer to deal with legislation, but we recognise that it is necessary in this instance. I would mention that I welcome the inquiry by the Committee on Procedures on the use of LCMs, and I am sure the Committee for Communities will offer its view in due course. The Committee then noted a draft legislation consent motion at its meeting of 1 July 2020, but recognised as a result of the Bill being amended at third reading, this motion would also likely change. The Committee was also briefed on these amendments to the Bill, which were carried in the House of Commons on 30 June. These did not reflect changes in policy, but were required to omit references to the Scottish Parliament from the Bill to reflect the decision of the Scottish Government not to proceed with the LCM. At its meeting on 8 July, the Committee then agreed, in principle, to the extension to Northern Ireland of the provisions of the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill, as contained in the amended Clause 5 of and Schedules 2 and 3 to the Bill through an appropriate legislative consent motion. The Committee was therefore expecting the amended motion and was briefed on it by department, departmental officials at its meeting on 16 September. At that meeting, the Committee agreed to support the amended motion. Therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Committee, I support the motion. Hearing, Sir Mark Durkin on Kanchi. May I have a yes, Kian Corlea. I thank the Minister for bringing this to the, the House today. This has been discussed at the committee a couple of the times, as the chair has outlined there today. And I think it is fair to say that I'm not the only member who's been a bit cautious, maybe even a bit confused about committing uh, to su supporting this. Uh, that has been compounded, I suppose, by the arrival of correspondence from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission last week that the minister has referred to and the comment her on her action uh, stemming from that. But I'm just going to ask and seek some clarification and assurances from the Minister today, which I'm sure she's well able to provide. My colleagues, the MP for Foy and the MP for South Belfast, voted against this bill in Westminster, and we have a number of concerns about it, and therefore, by extension, concerns about this Assembly giving our consent to it. Although this LCM deals only with the Social Security provisions of the bill, I should take this opportunity to reiterate our opposition to the swathe of delegated powers at hand to the Tory government, the party of the hostile environment, to establish a new immigration system after the transition period. On the social security provisions, however, I do have a number of questions that I would appreciate a clear response on from the Minister. Could uh, the Minister confirm, and I think she already has, that if the Northern Ireland provisions were omitted from the original bill, a further assembly bill would be needed to ensure that her department has the necessary powers to amend retained EU law on social security coordination? This would be preferable, I'm sure, and, and the Minister has alluded to this as is the Chair of the Committee, as it would give this House the time to scrutinise those provisions and to set out our opposition to the immigration clauses. The SDLP wants this system to work, and we are conscious of the time pressures with the pending exit from the EU, but to be frank, handing any powers over to a Tory government should be a last resort. I must say that this LCM is kind of difficult to square with the Minister's recent confirmation, welcome confirmation, that social security powers would be returned here from Westminster 
having been handed over by some parties here to the British Government at the time uh, the Welfare Reform Act was, was approved. The Ministers confirmed that the regulatory powers will be coming to the Assembly, but that begs the question, then why not the primary legislative powers? If there is a reasonable explanation for these to be made in London rather than in this Assembly, now is the time for us to hear it. The SDLP supports social security coordination with the EU and retaining EU provisions given our border situation. I do note the concerns raised by the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission about the impact that Schedule 1, Paragraph 6 may have on the payment of childcare within universal credit for working tax credit for cross-border workers who rely on childcare providers based over the border, and I can think of some families in my own uh, constituency this would apply to. The childcare has to be provided in the UK in order to access these elements, and it is EU law that has addressed this discrepancy, not the common travel area. It's another example of the creeping borderism that Brexit has instigated for those who can least afford it. And the Minister in this Assembly must be alert to it, and I'm sure many of us are. I will listen carefully to the Minister's response on this particular issue on how she will ensure that decisions will be made here and not in London about protecting practical childcare options for our cross-border workers. I urge the Minister to outline what the implications of all of these issues are and to explain why this LCM is absolutely necessary now, as opposed to a bill coming through the Assembly going forward. And I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. As others have said, the primary purpose of this bill is to end the EU rules and free movement of persons in respect of the UK at the end of the transition period, which is not too far away. We know that this means that EU nationals who are not resident in the UK before the end of the transition period will be required to obtain permission for themselves and their family members to enter and remain in the UK under the EU, or sorry, the UK Immigration Act 1971. It will not come as any surprise to say that this is one of the areas that Alliance is least comfortable with. Um, it's not something that we support. We do support the, the four freedoms within Europe, but we're realists and we absolutely re recognise and realise that what is contained within this bill, part two, clause five, is vitally important if we're to move forward with social security payments for those people. As the Minister has outlined, if we had to bring a bill to this assembly, it would take time. And we're probably heading into one of the busiest periods in this assembly um, that we will see for some years um, with the transition periods that are with the end of the transition period. I absolutely, others have mentioned, still in my thunder, Mark Durkin, um, the Human Rights Commission and the issue that has been raised, and of course with the chair um, of the committee, about childcare issues, and that is something that we need to consider going forward. But for this time, even though we are extremely concerned about the implications for freedom of movement, um, Alliance Party is content that the social security coordination with the EU is passed and progresses as necessary. Thank you. Next year, I'm sir, Matthew Toole. Hon can I call Matthew Toole. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, grateful and grateful to the Minister for um, bringing this uh, motion today. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as my colleague uh, Mark Durkin uh, uh, has just said, we have um, both specific and general concerns with the provisions in this bill uh, to which we are being asked to give legislative consent today. Um, though the provisions in the bill which touch on devolved competence and therefore require our consent uh, don't relate directly to immigration, as has been said, uh, that is an accepted matter. Uh, it is still worth putting on the record, um, and I intend to do so strongly, that, uh, that, since, that this bill is the legislative device which puts to an end many of the rights associated with freedom of movement uh, representing a proudly pro-European uh, party and constituency, uh, a constituency that includes a world-class university with students and academics from across the EU and indeed many EU nationals in general. I want to put on the record my own profound sadness and frustration that freedom of movement into Northern Ireland is ending. Uh, this is a profound loss to our society, our economy and our culture. 
Though people in Northern Ireland, uh, the people here are, are the people we represent, can still avail of freedom of movement across the EU through exercising their Irish and EU citizenship. It is a tragedy that we, uh, as a society here, are losing the contribution of inward freedom of movement um, that so many EU citizens have made uh, to our society. That is in part why, as, as Mark Durkin has said, um, my, my predecessor Claire Hanna and our party leader Colin Eastwood voted against this bill. Uh, at Westminster. Um, on the specific provisions of the bill, um, specifically Clause 5, which um, Kelly Armstrong just mentioned, uh, on social security coordination, clearly there are, uh, there are legal reasons why uh, much of this has to happen. Um, but what we are being asked to give legislative consent for, uh, it re requires the, 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 um, the Minister to give us a little more detail, uh, I think, on exactly why she has chosen to bring forward an LCM rather than discrete legislation. Firstly, though we appreciate this is a complex area of law, given the, clear given the clear statement from the Minister's Department that they would prefer to properly exercise social security powers at a devolved level, why was the decision made to agree to Westminster taking the power to legislate rather than introduce legislation here at Stormont? I should say it would also be helpful if the Minister could give us a little more detail on how this legislation interacts with the common travel area. It does, not the parts we're being asked to give uh, legislative consent to, but earlier provisions in the legislation um, set out the rights of Irish citizens. That's welcome, um, but clearly there are issues uh, that need to be explained in terms of how it interacts with the common travel area. If the Minister could say a little bit, a little bit more, um, that would be welcome. Uh, but just in relation to why the Department uh, chose not to, um, not to introduce legisl primary legislation here rather than uh, accept uh, an LCM. It would be helpful um, if she could give a clear statement uh, uh, on behalf of her department as to why they chose not to bring um, a clear statement. I know she's alluded to it in her, in, her, in her remarks at the beginning as to why they chose not to bring primary legislation given the, what she has said is their preference um, in terms of uh, exercising social security powers at the devolved level. Uh, we have heard specifically from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission about gaps in terms of cross-border childcare provision around universal credit. If she could say something about how that's going to be addressed, I know she's already writing to the Northern Ireland Human Rights uh, Commission. But more broadly, I think in conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we're going to do lots of this over the months to come. And it's really concerning that we're doing it at such a fast pace. We seem to be getting into a vicious cycle of not having enough time to scrutinise, of having to do things quickly because there's not enough time to scrutinise. Um, and then we don't have enough time to scrutinise because there's loads that we have to get through. It reinforces itself and it's not helpful. I accept this is something that's going to happen across the executive in multiple different departments. I think that's why it's important that the First and Deputy First Minister give a clear statement to the Assembly about the volume of primary and secondary legislation that committees and plenary are going to have to get through in the months to come because it won't be good enough in the new year whenever we have to explain not just hopefully we'll have a deal, hopefully we won't have complete chaos on the 1st of January, but even if we do have a deal and we have specific bits of uh, difficulty and disruption that come from substandard scrutiny in this assembly, we will have to explain to our constituents why we rush through legislative consent motions, why we rush through secondary legislation without giving it proper scrutiny. So in that spirit, I'd like to hear a little bit more uh, from the Minister on some of the subjects that I've touched on today. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and I can't support this LCM because this bill repeals the main, or the main retained EU law relating to free movement and brings EEA nationals and their families, family members under UK immigration control. Controls, as has already been pointed out, um, have deliberately created a hostile environment by the UK government. It's another reason why Brexit is not good for Northern Ireland. And let's not forget that we are meeting today in the midst of a public health crisis that has pulled pulled the veil back on the deep inequalities and unfairness in our society that has shown the extraordinary value of what so many workers do for our families and for our communities. They give excuses that we're just too busy or that we cannot foot the bill as reasons to allow this to pass without taking responsibility. It's just pretty shameful. This bill today will send a very powerful message to people that they are not considered by the UK government to be, wel to be welcome here. Our shop workers not welcome, our refuge collectors, our local government workers, our NHS staff, our care workers, but of course they are. 
So for those who were out clapping for the thousands of EU nationals in the NHS and the care sector are now sending the message today that they're no longer welcome, that is not fair, and I for one cannot support it. I believe this bill will destroy opportunities for future generations and will split even more families apart. It will result in many thousands of EU nationals losing their right in the UK. It will copper fast in a hostile environment even further. This bill brings to an end the one part of the UK migration system that works well, the free movement of people. Pushing ahead with this bill in the midst of a public health crisis is badly misjudged and shows that the UK government is completely out of touch. The primary purpose of the bill is to end for the UK the EU's role in the free movement of people at the end of the transition period. Those rules are currently retained in UK law by the European Union Withdrawal Act. The ending of the rules on the free movement will mean that EEA nationals who are not resident in the UK at the end of the transition period, New Year's Eve this year, and their family members will require permissions to enter and remain in the UK under the Immigration Act of 1971. What we should have had is a bill that makes it simpler instead of harder to recruit the NHS, the social care and other staff that we need, and not one that uses financial thresholds such as a poor substitute for skills, experience or contribution. We should have a bill setting out a comprehensive system of visa extensions for those frontline workers and their families. We need a bill that scraps the minimum income requirements for family visas and suspends other financial thresholds, acknowledges that migrant families and workers have had their incomes reduced, just like so many other workers. That is not this bill, and therefore I cannot in good conscience support it. We have witnessed time and again that this Tory government care none for the principle of consent and today everyone in this House should refuse it. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, this, I think, is the first debate touching upon Brexit issues that I've sensed any reality coming upon this House. Uh, you know, it's very well to have all the bravado of uh, opposing a bill such as this in Westminster and the SDLP and the Alliance Party preening themselves as great Europeans defending the principles of free movement and uh, all of that and uh, berating the idea of the United Kingdom controlling its own immigration and its own borders. But here they are today. And courtesy of a Sinn Féin minister, no less, this Assembly is about to, quite correctly, is about to endorse fundamental principles of Brexit, that the United Kingdom should control its own immigration, that the United Kingdom, in that sense, should control its own borders. And how luxurious is the irony that it is a Sinn Féin minister that is bringing to this House that very proposition, that this House could, should consent to legislation in Westminster that does that very thing. That's progress. That's good. It's the first dose of reality, and it won't be the last touching upon Brexit. Some say, vote down this bill. Oh, you vote down this bill. You vote down the survival of the rights of Irish citizens to Social Security. Is that what you want? I don't know. But let's be very clear. Brexit always was a national issue. It always meant that this nation of the United Kingdom was going to have to take some unitary decisions. And those unitary decisions touching upon immigration and borders are central to this bill. And all those who paraded themselves as those who would never accept 
those implications of Brexit are amongst those who today will go through the lobby if a vote is called to vote for it. That's good. And I look forward to further reality in this House. Dear yeah, Sir, Jerry Carroll, on can you call Jerry Carroll? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to start by saying that uh, people before profit in my party unequivocally oppose the, the Tories' immigration and social security coordination bill. Uh, and more widely, we oppose uh, Boris Johnson and the Tories' nefarious plans for restricting the freedom of movement for people uh, into Britain and indeed the north of Ireland. British immigration policy has always been based upon exploitation and indeed structural racism. And it is deeply worrying that the Tories wish to repeal current laws in a way that inevitably harks back to even more racist immigration policies of the 1970s, or perhaps even worse, and the aims to implement a, a points-based system uh, that mirrors the racist practices of many other countries across the world. Uh, and in particular, we oppose Clause 1 of this bill, which will uh, end freedom of movement from other EU countries, replacing it with nothing and opening the door to an even more restrictive immigration system. Mr Speaker, to be frank, I'm no big fan of the EU as an institution uh, regarding the question of immigration. Uh, it does have a, a terrible record in some regards, as thousands of uh, dead migrants in the Mediterranean uh, Sea illustrate in a tragic uh, and painful way. That said, while the EU uh, does have a shocking record in treatment of refugees uh, outside of its borders, the freedom of movement between EU states is one principle that should be robustly uh, defended. And as a socialist, I am opposed to borders and division generally, whether they are erected across states or inside people's heads. And I support the freedom of movement of people across the world, not just in Ireland or in Europe, but everywhere. If the rich man can move freely across the globe, so too should the poor and marginalised avail of such a right. The main thrust of this bill, however, is to ensure that legislation for free movement across the EU will be repealed, and afterward, EEA citizens and their families who come to Britain will be subject to immigration laws and require permission uh, to enter and remain. And the Tories have already set out their stall, as others have indicated, toward a future uh, immigration points-based system, which, in my opinion, will be inherently racist. For example, one piece of government commission advice states that the, only the, and I quote, brightest and best talent from around the world will be allowed entry. This is Tory speak for shutting the doors on those people who are fleeing from war, poverty and climate destruction all of which were a great responsibility uh, on British imperialism, actually, in particular. Thus, while the, the long-standing question mark over the Irish community living in Britain may have been partially addressed in this bill, it jeopardises the lives of thousands and thousands of other migrants living in and entering Britain uh, in the period ahead. So we oppose this bill because it represents a dark day for immigrants and refugees who are in search of a better life. This bill is being pushed through Westminster, and this LCM relates to the provisions obviously devolved uh, to here. And I recognise that some in this chamber, um, the Minister may have indicated this already, who oppose the Tories' immigration bill will probably and sort of have, in effect, made an argument for passing the LCM that it may uh, allow the Assembly to make the most of a, of a bad situation that's been forced upon us and allows us to influence Social Security payments. Uh, and I respectfully disagree with this argument and believe it is a, a mistaken uh, approach to take uh, and re regards or represents endorsing a dangerous piece of legislation in this way. And I would urge members to look closely at the recent report from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission which does state that there is no secure protection for those who will have a settled status prior to the closing date of the scheme in June 2021, nor is there any provision for safeguarding the rights of those EU citizens or migrants who arrived before January 2021. In addition, clarification is needed as to how these changes of rules will apply to Irish citizens in Britain as well. In my view, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, we should have no truck with this Tory bill, and every method of resisting it should be utilised, including rejecting the use of a legislative consent motion. The parties in this chamber should unite to obstruct the Tories' plans as much as, much as they can. And I note that the Scottish Assembly has until now refused to implement an LCM on these provisions. And I would suggest that the Executive could also follow uh, this path as well. And instead, introduce, as others have indicated, introduce its own bill that addresses social security uh, payments for immigrants. Uh, this, in my opinion, would include, should include a rapid expansion of social security payments for all those in need. And it is unclear to me still why the executive could not have done this, uh, because we're all at, all the talk of needing 
uh, to implement a racial equality strategy. The truth is this executive has presided over a shocking treatment of refugees and asylum seekers for many, many years. So I would say in conclusion, open the, open the borders now, Katie Mila Falcha to refugees, asylum seekers and immigrants, and uh, reject the Tories' approach to the issue of immigration, and this Assembly should step up to defend migrants, refugees, in a way that offer, offers a positive and equal future for all. Thank you. Thank you. I guess now she is here on conclude your correlation. I call on the minister to conclude on the debate. Thank you. Gorm Elgut, last count caller, and I suppose it was inevitable, really, that once this LCM was brought forward, people would use it as an opportunity to talk about their opposition to Brexit. So I have no issue with that. But what does all need to be clear about is that this LCM is on the basis of a no deal to ensure the benefits get paid. And I know you know that, and you are making politics, and that's fine. That's what this chamber is for. But at least be honest. At least be honest. And in relation to giving powers to Westminster in the first place, it was done so you could bring half a billion pounds protections to mitigate, mitigate against, against the worst impacts of the Tory government. So let's be honest about that too. So we're bringing powers back. And if I had an opportunity, I wouldn't be doing this. But I'm not about to cut people off at the knees over rhetoric, folks, frankly. It's all very well and good to get up and say what you would and wouldn't do, most of which I agree. But at least I'm honest and be honest and do it with integrity about why you want this not to happen. I understand it's anti Brexit, so I'm with you on that. But see the rest, it's guff, and you know it's guff. If there was an opportunity, and there should be an opportunity to bring bespoke legislation, but see, because of COVID and everything else, it's slipped. But I do agree with you on this. There does need to be better social security legislation here, where we have the ability to scrutinise it ourselves, to protect people who are worse off. That's a raison d'etre for us all. That's where we all agree. So I'm not going into the whole issue of who said and what said. This is simply about the power to make regulations on the basis of a no deal. So people aren't left with no child benefit or benefits. Shine. So the rest of it is about free movement. It's nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with us either. Although I agree with your whole issue. In relation to everything else that's been said, any queries that have been raised, I will faithfully, as I think I've done up until now, try and get a proper response because I want to be on the record in challenging some of the things that were said, as well as giving you the information. And with that, I commend this to the House. Thank you. Um, the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Okay, so the motion passes. Next item is private members' business on the order paper, and that's a motion on children with hearing difficulties and deafness. I will ask the clerk to read the motion.